know that I've been in uh, ministry my whole adult life, and I have had my share of funerals, memorial services. For believers, I always call them graduation services because it's a promotion. Amen? Amen. It's a promotion. And services for those who are believers versus those who are not believers are so different. We lost a dear brother in the Lord in Calvin. But our loss is heaven's gain. My wife lost her aunt last week and was in Arizona for that service. A very, very godly woman. Again, our loss is heaven's gain. And I'll tell you the most important question that both Kelvin and my wife's aunt face is, what did you do with my son? What did you do with the Messiah? Folks, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. You can do all the great works on this planet you want to do, but if you do them apart from the Messiah, when your time comes and you face the Lord, those works will do you no good. There is no way on our own we could earn our way into the presence of a holy and awesome God. It took the death of the pure Messiah on the cross in our place. And the thing the Lord requires of us is to accept that forgiveness. And that's what matters. I want to do something a little bit different uh, this morning to start things off. Um, so if you would trust me for a moment, I want you just to close your eyes. Some of you have been waiting to do that anyway, so. <laughs> close your eyes, <clears throat> and, and I'm going to do a brief survey. How many of you have had the privilege of leading someone to salvation. Okay. Thank you so much. How many of you believe it's really important to lead people to salvation? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing like that. The Messiah was known as a friend of sinners. Do you remember that passage in Scripture? In fact, he was criticized for that. He eats with tax gatherers and sinners. Every Shabbat, we sing the words, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you remember that? Now, sometimes you do something so often it becomes tired and you, you do it, but it doesn't mean much anymore. But every Saturday you're here, you will sing, you shall love the Lord, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I like what Rob said, when our words meet our actions. It's easy to talk a good game. It's not quite as easy to live a good game. You see, the thing that my wife's aunt and Calvin are most thankful for, that at a time in their life, someone shared about Yeshua with them. Someone shared the way of salvation. That is what they are most joyous about right now. I heard it said when I was a young believer, if you saw a house on fire and there were people inside sleeping, would you walk by or would you run to the door and warn them about it? You have to realize every unbeliever in our lives are residing in a spiritual house on fire. And our privilege is to knock on the door of their heart and say, there's a way to be saved. And again, I can tell you the greatest thing that Calvin and my wife's aunt are thankful for today is that someone knocked on the door of their heart and told them how to be saved. I'm in a series, we could call it a series, that meets once a month. 
on Jewish apologetics. I'm working from the book, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. And I know here we, we say Yeshua, and if you remember, our speaker, because he was here, when he was asked, why do you use the word Jesus? He said, well, if I said Yeshua, the Jewish people that I talked to wouldn't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> so he uses this. And, and my background is in Christian apologetics. And I'll tell you something. You can learn a lot. You can answer a lot of questions. But I truly believe... People want to know that you care about them. You can have all the answers, but if they don't know that you love them, I'm not sure they're going to ask the questions. So we continue in this series to give you, for lack of a better expression, spiritual ammunition. But as you know, weapons can protect and weapons can harm. I've known some very knowledgeable people that are so offensive, people don't care what they're talking about anyways. So the hope is that you will take the knowledge you gain into a redeemed heart that can share it with love for your neighbor. Because remember, as you sing every week, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So with that in mind, uh, Dr. Michael Brown points to several objections that Jewish people will bring up why they want to uh, disregard Yeshua. And he says one of the classic and maybe most popular objections is that if Yeshua is really the Messiah, why isn't there peace on earth? Because isn't the Messiah supposed to bring peace? Have you guys heard that from Jewish folks that object to the gospel? Yeah. And so uh, I want to encourage you to get this book because there's only so much we can do in, in one message on this topic. It's a very deep topic, and there's no way we'll truly do it complete justice here. But if you're interested, there's a great section in this book on that topic. I want to encourage you to get it. Uh, Chris, do we have any copies of this out there? Okay. Uh, get a copy of this and read it. You'll enjoy it. It will deepen your faith. It will help you be prepared to answer the question. So there are a few passages that he points to. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, Malachi 3, 1 to 5, Hosea 3, 4 and 5. But he points to one that may be the main passage that, that a Jewish person might pull out and object to. And that is from Isaiah chapter 2. So uh, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2. Let's take a look. If you don't have a Bible, scoot over to someone next to you in your row and uh, tell them you owe them lunch for not bringing your Bible today. I know Biola at, at chapels, they would say, okay, turn to the Bible in your row. I thought it was funny. You're at a Christian Bible school and uh, <laughs> university and nobody brought up their Bible to chapel. So that was turn to the Bible in your row. All right, Isaiah chapter 2, picking up in verse 1, it says this, The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It says, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For they all will go from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So this is one passage that's looked to and Jewish people say, look, when the Messiah comes, there's going to be no more wars. 
There's going to be peace on earth. And so how could you possibly say that they would say Jesus, they wouldn't say Yeshua. They would say, how could you possibly say Jesus is the Messiah when there's no peace on earth? And there's fascinating research on this topic. Uh, one of the things that Michael Brown says is that although the passage speaks of eventual peace, you'll notice it doesn't mention the Messiah. And oftentimes, people hear just what they want to hear, and they assimilate different parts of Scripture together and try to make it say what they want it to say. If you read and reread this passage, it talks about peace, but it doesn't mention the Messiah. It doesn't come out and say, yes, when the Messiah comes to earth the first time, that he will bring peace. And once he's there, there's going to be peace on earth. And there's several problems with that concept. First of all, we have what we call the fallacy of the complex question. Now, a complex question is this. A complex question asks two questions. It answers one and leaves one for you to answer. And you have to be very careful in sharing your faith with Jewish people, or anyone for that matter, because so often we speak in complex questions we don't even realize it. Now, the classic one is, is I don't think it ever really happened, but, but it was in a court of law, and the, the uh, attorney was cross-examining the witness, and he said, Sir, when did you stop beating your wife? How do you answer that question? Because implied in that, there's two questions. One, are you beating your wife? Yes. Two, when did you stop? Well, wait a second. Just by asking that, there's certain questions you can't answer. Because just by asking that question, you're already agreeing to the first part of that. So when people say, well, Jesus can't be the Messiah because when the Messiah comes, there'll be peace. Well, wait a second. How do you get that? How do you really study the passages and, and get that when he comes, there'll be complete peace on earth when the Messiah touches down. The complex question is this. The first part is, when the Messiah comes, he will bring peace on earth. And they're answering yes to that. And then how can Yeshua be the Messiah since there is no peace? The problem is what we would call eisegesis. And it's not with a J, it's with a G. Eisegesis is bringing your own idea to the Scripture and forcing it on it. Exegesis is going to the Scripture and pulling the truths out. Now look, not, not only Jewish people are guilty of this, believers are guilty of this. We have our idea and we write our own Bibles. And we force it on the Scripture. I'm amazed at what passes often today as biblical teaching. These weird ideas, I get emails and devotions from all type of teachers around the country, and, and stuff comes to my email, I go, what, where do you get this from? What, what strange, weird uh, 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 you know, translation or paraphrase of the Bible did you use to find that verse and make it say that? I say oftentimes we read our scripture with a, with a Sharpie, you know, a Sharpie highlighter, and we, we just kind of highlight out the passages we don't like. It's so important to go to God's Word with an open heart and a teachable heart. The Bible does speak, Dr. Brown says, of eventual peace, but it does not say there will be peace on earth beginning with the first coming of Messiah. And again, I'm encouraging you to get this book because I want you to go deeper into this topic. That is a very important point to remember. The Bible does teach that peace will come but it doesn't teach that peace will be there on earth with the first coming of the Messiah. And here are some of the great points I think that he makes. First of all, verses referring to Messiah bringing peace at his first advent pertain to peace between man and God. At his second advent, refer to peace among people. And there's a difference. The scripture does talk about peace, but when Messiah came... He came to bring, bring peace between man and God. And let me ask you this question. What's more important, having peace with God or peace with your fellow man? One of the reasons Yeshua was rejected is because the Jewish people were looking for the Messiah to overthrow the Roman government and give them peace there in their land. But yet they had no peace with God. 
Remember he said, you're, 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 use your, your lips and your words to honor me, but your heart is far from me. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now just look at that verse for a moment on your own. Just take a look at your Bible. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Is this offering unqualified peace to all men? What do you think? To whom is the Messiah offering peace? Those with whom he is pleased. There is no blanket offer of peace to the entire globe. There is no blanket offer of peace to every human being. There's an offer of peace to those with whom he is well pleased. Now, do you think God is well pleased with all mankind? How could he possibly offer peace? In the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Right? You remember that? What kind of peace are we talking about there? What do you think? So often we think of it that it means peace among people. And perhaps that can be true as well. But ultimately, it's for those who help offer peace between God and man. Those who help people come to salvation, come to forgiveness, and find peace because we are hostile to God. We are sinners. And we need that peace. Blessed are the peacemakers of those who share the gospel. When you share the gospel and someone comes to know the Messiah, that part of Scripture applies directly to you. You are blessed because you have helped bring peace between a sinner and God. And I'll tell you what, folks, that is our primary calling in life. Did you know that? It is our primary calling to bring peace between man and God. That's what the Lord wants us to do. When I ask you to raise your hand if you have led someone to the Lord, there was a good showing. But there definitely were hands that did not go up. And I want to encourage you, if you've never led someone to the Lord, to begin to pray about that. To begin to ask the Lord to bring people into your path. I could almost guarantee you know people in your life that are not saved. There are those people in your world that you see on a regular basis that do not know the Messiah. And, and the Lord is calling you to introduce them to Him, to be the peacemaker. Because we are at odds with God. We are sinners. We do things that God says we shouldn't do, and we don't do things that God says we should do. And we need a peacemaker. And the Lord has given us the privilege to do that. Secondly, uh, Dr. Brown says that the view of Messiah as simply bringing peace among people on the earth, according to the Scripture, is too narrow a definition of Messiah. And he points to other uh, objectives that the Messiah has. And, and first and foremost is the redemption of lost people. You see, again, the Jewish people, when, when Yeshua came, were so concerned about peace in their land that they missed the point that it's more important to have peace with God than peace with man. Yeshua said this, if they hated me, they're going to what? Hate you. How do you have peace? He already told us. The, the, the scripture never contradicts itself. Yeshua never contradicted the scriptures. And if he said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute my followers. How do you have peace? Why are we so concerned about peace with man instead of peace with God? Uh, most conservatives are up in arms over the Iranian nuclear deal because it gives too much freedom and flexibility to a rogue country that has proven 
uh, that, that in many ways they could not be trusted. And so even uh, Franklin Graham has come out in support of Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, did you ever see those two as partners? Came out and supported him because he is against the Iranian nuclear deal. But often our government is so concerned with peace among men that we compromise our values. And you got a whole field of politicians saying, just get me into office, into office and I'll change all that. I hope that's true. Right. <laughs> we are so concerned today with being politically correct. I am so tired of hearing that expression. We've shortened it to just PC now, just politically correct. And it's getting ludicrous. The day is coming where we're not going to be able to put, you know, men and women on restrooms. There's speculation that Target is going to get rid of boys, toys for boys, toys for girls, because it's, it's discriminatory. It's on the internet. It's got to be true. It's getting absolutely out of control. Why? Because people are afraid of offending others. There's these great posts on Facebook that say, the year 2015 when everybody was offended about everything. <laughs> and, and it's crazy. If you stand up for, for biblical values, all of a sudden you're a hater. Yeah. All of a sudden you, you, you're, you're this terrorist. But remember, Yeshua said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And you have to be ready for that. You see, our society is too concerned with peace among men and not concerned enough with peace with God. It was a problem 2,000 years ago. It's the same problem today. The concern was bring us peace on earth. But how about peace with God? If I had to choose one, I'll choose peace with God. My old pastor, who also recently went home to be with the Lord, was asked to pray at a high school graduation at Garden Grove High School. This is going back several years. And he said, the only thing you can't do is when you pray, you can't pray in the name of Jesus because you're going to offend our, our Jewish visitors. And his response was, well, if I don't pray in the name of Jesus, I know one Jew that's really going to be offended. And he prayed. He prayed just like that. You see, it's such a narrow view of Messiah to say all his job is is to come and bring peace to this locality. It's an unfortunate, a shallow view. There's some great um, articles and even videos on the, on the web as well. And I, I watched one gentleman. I thought it was great. He said, the problem with this is if you say snap your fingers... And the Messiah, in essence, snaps his fingers. There's peace on earth. The problem is that it wouldn't last. He said, because peace is a matter of the heart, and corrupt and sinful hearts would soon thereafter engage in war again. I think that's the key issue here. To say that Messiah is going to bring peace on earth, apart from there being peace with God, is impossible. How do you have that? Think about that for a moment. How do you create an earth where there's peace unless there's peace with God? There are always wars. Have you ever known in a time in your lifetime when there's not a war going on somewhere? There's estimates that at any given day, uh, 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 80 to 90 countries are at war. You see, it's our heart that's the issue. For there to be peace on earth, there first has to be peace with God to be peace with man. And so I thought his observation was great. Sure, Messiah could go, peace on earth. But unless hearts were changed, 
wars would develop. Immediately. Immediately. There are people that hate you because you live in this country. There are people who would think twice about killing you simply because you are an American. In fact, you may have never done anything to harm them. In fact, you may have even helped them in some way. But because you're from this country, they hate you. You see, the heart is wicked. It's evil. It's sinful. To be peace on earth, there could be no false religions. How could you have peace on the earth unless every heart was in tune with God? You have religions that say it honors their God to kill people that don't follow their religion. How do you have peace as long as that religion exists? You see, Yeshua fits into the role of Messiah perfectly in Scripture. In John 18, 36, he said this, My kingdom is not of this world. Have you seen those stickers on cars, not of this world? He said, if my kingdom were of this world, when my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. If Yeshua would have come and tried to set up a kingdom on earth, right away you would have known this is not the Messiah. He was trying to tell them, quit worrying about peace right now, right here. With man, you need to have peace with God. You have a friend that's more concerned about pleasing men than pleasing God. You got to tell him, look, when the day comes, and like my wife's aunt, like Kelvin, you stand before God, not going to be too concerned with whether or not you're politically correct, whether you please man. It's going to be concerned about whether you pleased him. And then he says, where there's physical peace between all people, all people must have a relationship with the Messiah. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 to 34. It's a great passage. It says, But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now, for you astute biblical scholars, what will we not be doing in that time? What will, what will there be no need for during that time? Starts with an E. And ends with evangelism. There's no, there'll be no more evangelism. Did you get that? You won't need to teach people, no, Lord. They will all know him. You see, when there's truly peace, there will be peace because everyone knows the Messiah. You cannot just come and say, peace on earth, if everyone does not know Messiah. Peace will come. As Dr. Brown points out, peace will come. And in fact, the Jews have that right to some extent. But their timeline is off. Peace will come in the end. And it will come because people know the Messiah. Not because there was a snap of the fingers and all of a sudden there was peace. Because peace will come only when there's peace in your heart with God. See, the problem was that when Yeshua came, many of the Jewish people mistook the kingdom to be earthly and temporal. But God's kingdom is eternal. God is eternal and so is his kingdom. And, and the problem is this. I'm going to stretch it a little bit. When we think of eternity, we think of forward. We rarely think of backward. If something is eternal, it not only will exist forever, it has existed forever. To simply say you would set up a kingdom on a temporal earth that has not existed forever would be logically incorrect. 
the kingdom of God is eternal and it will exist in a place that is going to be eternal. It is not temporal. It is not short-lived. Messiah did bring peace. Dr. Brown points out he brought peace to all who would embrace him and turn from sin. And he brought peace to all his people who would follow him. The promise was true. Unfortunately, many incorrectly make the application. Peace. Messiah brought the most important peace. Peace between God and man. Peace among men will come, but not yet. Not until, as Jeremiah 31 says, all people know the Lord. Now, I just want to close with an application. And if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm a real bread and butter kind of preacher. I love the uh, intellectual stuff. I love the apologetics. But let me tell you this, folks. All the knowledge in the world is not going to do you a lot of good unless the people with whom you share it know that you love them. Walter Martin was probably my, my favorite apologist. I don't know if you all remember Walter Martin. He started the yeah, Christian Research Institute. It's called the Bible Answer Man. Photographic memory. You could ask that guy any question about the Bible or any religion, and he had it like a walking encyclopedia. And I remember him making this statement because he was training younger people to defend the faith. And oftentimes, young folks are very zealous to win their argument. Walter Martin said this. I remember this from 1979. He says, remember, you can win the argument but lose the soul. You can win the argument, but lose the soul. I know Doug's been teaching through 1 Corinthians. And I want to just recap a verse he's probably hit on. This first couple of verses of chapter 13, 1 Corinthians says this. If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you may have the truth, and you may know the answers, but if you don't do it with love, it's like coming up behind someone's head and smashing cymbals together. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. I don't care how much you know, folks. The question is, do you believe what you're seeing every Saturday? You shall love your neighbors, you love yourself. Are you more concerned about getting the right answer than loving your neighbor? And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. That's my question for you today. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love those with whom you come in contact? Oftentimes, the secular world around us knows much more what believers are against than what they're for. You probably heard of a guy named Johnny Depp. He's been in a lot of movies. I don't think he's in any way a believer. But you know what Johnny Depp is known for? Taking break in between shoots at movies and going to children's hospitals and visiting kids. Come on, does this guy have to do that? Is he, is he some great person now? But here's a guy who's probably not a believer taking his time to go and visit children with cancer in, in hospitals. And I guess my question to you is, when's the last time you've done something that just loved somebody? That just said, 
because I love my Messiah, I'm going to love people around me. How do you show that love? I was a youth pastor at a church in uh, Monarch Beach back in the late 80s. I'm a pretty zealous guy. I've mellowed a lot. And uh, not in my love for the Lord, but in, I guess, being as obnoxious as I was. I mean, if you knew me when I was in my 20s, about 10, 10 15 years ago, um, <laughs> I was really obnoxious, to tell you the truth. I mean, I love God, but there was something missing in my emotional development. So you can be a, a very knowledgeable Christian, but be underdeveloped emotionally or interpersonal skills, and you can push people away from you. Isn't that true? And my pastor at that time sat me down. In fact, he was a psychologist. That was his, it was his degree was in psychology. He was a pastor. And he was a, just the nicest guy. And I was just, I was just kind of going on one of my tirades about what we needed to do and he just listened. He goes, Mark, let me tell you something you need to remember. And most of you have probably heard this. He says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I-, I want you to hold on to that. I want you to hold on to that. Because that person you work with, that person you live next to, that family member that you say really needs Messiah, They don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care about them. And how have you loved them? How have you shown your love? We got a world today that wants to be politically correct, love and accept everybody. And here comes believers going, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. How about going to the children's hospitals and loving on those people? How about going to convalescent homes and loving on people's parents who live in a different state or can't get by to see their family? How about going to that neighbor that lost their job and and giving them gift certificates for a grocery store? How about getting our heads out of the clouds and down here to people around us that are saying, is there really a God? Before you you answer all my questions, I want to see God in you. Show them God in you, then they'll probably want to hear about the God you know. My homework for you is to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 and ask the Lord, Lord, now that I have this knowledge to answer these questions, what needs to happen in my heart So I really love my neighbor. Not just act like it, not just do something, but do you really love them? See, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, and you understand the definition of love, you may see how far you are away from truly loving your neighbor. But if you really want to be that person who introduces people to the Messiah, you read that passage, and then you say, Lord, I'm not there, but help me, help me to love my neighbor as you've taught me to, as you've told me to, so I might have the privilege to answer their questions when they have them. I guarantee you, you start loving people around you, they're going to start asking you about your Messiah. They're going to ask, why are you different? Why did you do that? Why do you care? People always ask, how do you witness? How do you bring it up? I'll tell you how. This is it. Start obeying the Bible. Start obeying what you sing every Saturday. Love your neighbor. Just start loving people. Ask them, how do I love these people? Then you'll get the chance to answer their questions. Because I'll tell you this, they don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning and for your word. Thank you that there are such great answers for our Jewish friends around us. Lord, Jewish people are just people too. Many of them are hurt. Many of them are discriminated against. 
They have been wounded by people that go by the banner of Christians. And there really needs to be some healing of the ways. Lord, show us ways to reach out to our Jewish friends and, and all friends around us to love them. Help us to be honest with ourselves and ask, do we really love our neighbor? Do we really love them? And if we don't, Lord, would you help us do that? Help us love them so we may have the privilege of answering their questions about you. Lord, we really believe people, people don't really care how much we know until they know how much we care. Help us to be a congregation that people know how much we care. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.